Good evening and welcome to the Mount Marine Baptist Church Tuesday Night Bible Talk. Tonight we will be continuing a study of the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you for sewing into the ministries of Mount Marine Baptist Church. If you worship with us in person, you may place your contribution in the offering box, which is located at the front entrance. You can mail your contributions to Post Office Box 108, Fishersville, Virginia 22939. You may also give online by visiting our website at mtmarine.org. Your generosity will help to fulfill our mission to build disciples and win souls for Christ. You are encouraged to share today's Bible talk with your family and friends. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. God bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall be glad and rejoice in it. Thank you for joining the Mount Marine Baptist Church Tuesday night Bible talk. Uh, we will be covering Matthew starting at uh, chapter 17, chapter 17, verses 22. And I think that I may be able to get through the entire uh, chapter of 18, but we'll see how that um that works out um, on tonight. So Father, we thank you, Lord God, and we bless your holy name for being so gracious and, and so kind. We ask, oh God, that you will just talk to your people and open up their hearts and their minds, oh God, and, and expand their thinking, Lord God, beyond that which they have, have learned in a traditional way uh, within the body of Christ, oh God. Show them, Lord God, how the word of God applies to them. In Jesus Christ, I pray, Amen. So God bless you again and welcome to the Mount Marine Baptist Church Tuesday night Bible talk, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, picking up in verse 22. Um, so, so remember Jesus, he had gone up to the mountain and transfigured before his disciples, at least three of them, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He comes down, there's drama because there's a there's a man whose son is an epileptic, epileptic and he took them to the disciples and they could not do anything. And Jesus, Jesus and the disciples, they leave that scene and they were gathering in Galilee. They gathered in Galilee and Jesus says to them, the son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. So this is the second time that Jesus mentions his death and resurrection. This is what, this is what is known as the, the passion prediction. It takes place as they were gathering in Galilee the second, the second time, at least according to the gospel of, of Matthew. The first time um, Jesus um, discusses his, his death, burial, and resurrection is, is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, because Jesus says, because Jesus, he was then in Caesarea Philippi, all right? And Jesus, he begins to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and scribes. So this is basically after um, Jesus asks the question, who do man say that I am? And then Peter raises up his hands, hey, hey, you're the Christ, all right? So it seems like every time Jesus shows himself or reveals himself, then, then he begins to um, tell his disciples more about which is um, to come. Jesus explains in verse 23, he says, and this is what they're going to do to me. They're going to kill him. But he says, but on the third day, he will be raised to life. And when Jesus makes this statement, the disciples, they were filled um, with grief. Sometimes we only hear part of a conversation instead of all of which has been said because I believe they start started grieving when once Jesus said that he will be killed but the good news was, was that Jesus says but on the third day he will be raised to life they're grieving over the fact that Jesus says that he would die but they didn't allow Jesus to finish the question and say, oh, by the way, here's the good news. The good news is that on the third day, I'm going to be raised. And instead of listening in for the voice of God to tell them the good news, they're hanging out and grieving over something that they had previously heard. 
And I would submit that there are some of you right now that are still grieving over things that you heard. And it was so devastating that you don't hear the good news that God has been trying to get into you after that which took you down, kept you down. But if you ever want to get to a place where you want to be what? Delivered, set free, right? And get rid of all of that negative noise that people have been speaking into your life. Because there's always good news after someone's bad. And after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, because they leave from the, from the region of Galilee, because they're pushing on to Jerusalem, right? So from Galilee to, to um, Capernaum, Jesus, he meets up, or a tax collector meets up with Jesus and the disciples. But this is not your ordinary tax collector. This was the tax collector of, and they called him the two drachma tax collector. And this tax collector, his only goal and his only task was to collect the temple tax. The temple tax was collected from the outsiders, not those that were living in Jerusalem, but for the Jews that lived outside of Jerusalem. The tax collector of the, of the two drachma, his task was to go out to the regions outside of Jerusalem and collect the temple tax. And the temple tax was um, collected from males for the upkeep of the temple. Every male that was 20 years and older had to pay the temple tax. And this was collected annually because guess what? Even back then, even the temple could not run off of just your prayers. Now, the Samaritans who were outsiders and Gentiles who were outsiders, they were not required to pay because they were not allowed to enter into the temple. And the collectors came to Peter because Jesus was delinquent in paying his taxes. Let, let's go back. So they asked Peter a question. Why is Jesus not paying his temple tax? Text says, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter says, Yes, he does. And he speaks on Jesus's behalf. And when Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. Jesus knows the conversation that had taken place on the outside. But Jesus, he begins to tell Peter how things really should be going down. Jesus asks Peter, he says, Simon, he says, who do you think the king's of the earth collect the duty and the taxes from? Do the kings collect taxes from their children or for the people that are on the outside? Because Jesus is trying to show Peter that he is Lord, that he is the son of God, which means he's not the outsider by any means or any stretch of anyone's imagination. He is literally the son of God. And sons of the king were not obligated to pay taxes to anyone because the kings did not tax their kids. They only taxed the folk that were on the outsides. Kings don't t collect from their family members. They collect from the outsiders and the common folk. Peter answers the question. And Peter, he answers the question correctly because Peter says in verse 26, he says, he says, Jesus, kings, they collect from the outsiders because the kids of the kings are exempt from the taxes. Now, the lesson learned that Jesus was trying to teach Peter was this, is that he is connected to the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. 
He is the son of God. He is the son of the king. Therefore, he is exempted from paying the taxes. But when we look in verse 27, Jesus says, I'm going to take the high road because I don't want to offend anyone. How many of you know that sometimes in order to win the battle, the war, sometimes you have to lose the battle? Uh, Michelle Obama said it, and she said it this way so eloquently one time. When people go low, we go high. Now, I know some of you, you, you would be like, well, well, you know what? I ain't paying the taxes because, because I am the, the child of the most high God. I am the son of the king. But Jesus says, listen, I'm going to show you a lesson. And the lesson is this. Sometimes, what is that song um, that I used to listen to when I was a little kid? Hanging out with my father, playing the radio in his, in his car. Everybody plays the fool. Now, Jesus wasn't playing the fool. He was being wise. So that he would not cause offense, he says, go to the lake, throw out your line, take the first fish that you catch, <coughs> take the first fish, fish that you catch. catch. Because he, Jesus is all about making peace. Because Matthew 5 and 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, there are some of you out there that would never give in and give out to anyone because you always got to have the last say. You always got to have your way. And ain't nobody going to take advantage of you. Sometimes, you know what? I sit back and I watch folk take advantage of me. I know. I ordered two. I didn't order one. Matter of fact, the one that I got wasn't the one that I ordered, right? But I don't say anything because why? Because I can, you know what? I can, I can lose. I don't mind. I don't mind sitting, going in the background and doing anything. I don't mind sitting in the back, right? I don't have to be number one, but what I won't do, I will not cause a fuss. And this is what Jesus is doing. Because remember Jesus, he, he told his disciples from the last lesson. Last week, Jesus says, don't tell anyone that I am the son of God. So Jesus is on the down low and he's trying to get to Jerusalem without any um, confrontations. So he doesn't want to cause offense because he doesn't want to get into a confrontation. So he says, Peter, he says, I want you to go to the lake, throw out a line and take the first fish that you catch. Now, this is the first miracle that Jesus performs for himself. And Jesus, he, he, he says in verse 27, he says, open the fish's mouth. And he says, and you will find that which we are required to pay. Now, watch this. God makes ways out of no way, right? That's why Jesus says, hold up. There are some, some things in life that are not worth arguing over. Because see, the reason why God has not blessed some of you is because you always got to open up your mouth and you got to say things. You just got to talk out of the side of your neck. And every now and then, God says, watch this. I'm going to bless you as long as, as you take the high road, as long as you learn not, not how, not how to offend people, right? Because every time you offend people, guess what? Heaven is responding and it locks down. God doesn't need your help because they're asking Jesus to pay the tax. And guess what? Jesus tells Peter, he says, Peter, watch how heaven is going to respond. He says, go to the lake. Throw out a line, catch the fish, first fish that you catch, open his mouth. And he says, and you will find not two drachma for me, but he says, you're going to find four drachma, drachma and you're going to be able to pay my taxes and yours also. See, that's the kind of God that we serve. See, 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 see God is so, God is so gracious. He's, he's so kind that when you are. Uh, listening and walking into the walking in the will of God, God not only takes God can not only take care of you, but God can bless you, bless someone else through your actions. Right? Watch this. 
But in order for all of this to happen, some things had to take place first. Well, guess what happened? Jesus, he benefits from someone else's lost coin. I thought you needed to hear that. Because see, sometimes people, when they have something and when they lose something and when they and when somebody else finds it and after it's fine it is still lost to the person that lost it but has been found by someone else in other words when you mishandle or devalue something it will be found by another person and handled appropriately Someone mishandled the four drachma. It was a setup for Peter to catch it in the right fish. Peter catches the fish that pulled up the four drachma and it took care of the business that was at hand. So this means that you don't have to do these power struggles trying to trying to um, not do that which is necessary because even we do that which is necessary sometimes because it's necessary maybe it's not necessary to you but it's necessary to the kingdom of god and god is calling on his people to be the examples you don't have to always go out there and have your way guess what brothers if you're gonna have to be the punk for the day then go on be that punk for the day but guess what don't let people pull you down so that you go around offending people because you got to man up and you got to have your last word, okay? So we're picking up in chapter 18, verse one. It says, and at that time, Jesus or, or the disciples, they came to Jesus and then they, they asked Jesus this question. Now they're asking Jesus the question based on the reality that Jesus says, I'm going to I'm going to be killed by the religious rulers of the day and I'm going to be raised on the third day. They still missed a part of Jesus saying I'm going to be raised. Because here they are asking the question who's going to take your place. Be careful y'all. Because there's always somebody standing in line wanting to replace you. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's the very people that you're trying to help out that are trying to take your place. They ask the question, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? There is a power struggle going on because Jesus says, I will be killed by the religious rulers and elders in Jerusalem. Jesus uses children or a little child as an illustration. And he took the child and he placed the child in front of them. And the child becomes the teachable moment in the example. He uses a child that's not holding grudges because he childs, they play, they fight, they get up, they dust themselves off, they hug themselves, they cry, and then they begin to play again. Now see, grown folk in the church, if you don't speak to them, they'll, some of them have the audacity to leave and never return. And Jesus says, hold on, this is the problem. He says, you want to be the greatest, but if you want to be the greatest, you got to be just like this little one. Jesus says, truly I tell you, unless, watch this, he says there are two things that you got to do. He says, unless you change and become. He says, unless you revert and become like this little child he says he didn't say you may enter into the kingdom of heaven he says you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven he first uses himself as the illustration i don't really have to pay this taxes 
but I'm going to do it anyways because I don't want to offend anyone. And then he says, then he says, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, watch this. Baptism is not going to do it. You have to change and become humble. Because if you don't, because if you don't humble yourself, Jesus says, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, see, there's a little angel in the church. And every time she shows up in the church, she runs to my door and she looks for Pastor Brown. She comes and she's she's smiling. And what really trips me out sometimes is that she'll say some off the wall things. Right. And as she leaves, sometimes she'll say, see you later, buddy. See you, buddy. Bye, buddy. And I said, see you later. She said, alligator. See, 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 this is what Jesus wants. See, Jesus wants people to come in contact with other people. Right. Smiling. And knowing that when I contact with you, I'm going to have a good time with you. But some, sometimes, guess what you got to do? You got to go and chase folk down. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You got to learn how to humble yourself like the little child. See, grown folk, they show up. You got to chase them down. Then they leave no goodbye. And they don't ask you if you need any help. They just, they, they, they just go ghost on the brother and the sisters. Yet they feel like they are entitled and watch this entitled people don't think that they need to change let me say that one more time entitled people don't think that they need to change because they already feel like they have inherited the kingdom of god jesus picks up in verse four verse four he says he says therefore Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus says, I hate to burst your bubble. But if you're thinking that your position, your family last name, and the fact that you've been in your church for the past 50 years is going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. He says, you got it wrong. Because if you cannot humble yourself, then you will not be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 18, verse 5 says this, because Jesus, he's not done. He says, and oh, by the way, if you if you mishandle my humble people, because, you know, there are some people that put themselves on the on a pedestal, right? And they think that just because they're on the pedestal, right, that their stuff don't stink. And because their stuff doesn't stink, they think that they can treat other folk inappropriately, right? Matter of fact, there are whole families, right, who think that just because of, of their connections, that they have a blood bought right to treat everybody the way that they want to. But Jesus says, and whoever welcomes one such in my name, guess what? He says, you're welcoming me. So the next time you walk past somebody and you look down on them and you don't welcome them, then guess what? You cannot welcome Jesus, nor are you prepared, nor qualified to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But watch what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, verse six. And he he says, watch this. He says, and if anyone causes one of these humble people, humble Christians, those who believe in me to stumble. Happens all the time. People minding their business, following the Lord. And here comes the gossip king. Here comes the gospel queen, gossip king, queen, right? And she bends their ear. He bends his, he bends the brother ear, right? Then he has the people who were doing well at one time to start acting crazy like them. And what happens? They leave the church because of what someone else has said to them. But here's the crazy thing about it. Folk will talk you out of going to church, got you acting all ugly, and guess what they're doing? They're still showing up every Sunday, getting their shine on our own in a fake kind of way. But Jesus says, you got to be careful because if you cause another Christian, humble Christian to stumble, 
He says, and I, and he says, one that what? Believes in him. He's not talking about an unbeliever. He's not talking about someone outside of the church. But he says, if you cause one of these people of mine inside of my church to stumble, start acting ugly because you want to go around toting tails, he says, watch this. It would be better for you or for them to have a large millstone hung around your neck and to be thrown in the depths of the sea. Now, this is a horrible scene, but Jesus says it, what, what could happen to you would be worse than this, right? So Jesus says, be careful how you cause other people to treat other people wrong. If you want to treat a person wrong, treat them wrong. It's not right. I'm not trying to say it's right, but you're treading on dangerous water when you try to get your, your A team together and mistreat people, right? So, so for those people that are always doing the, doing the diligence, rolling up their sleeves and doing the doggone thing in their churches, leave them alone. Leave them alone because guess what? They really care about what they do. And they're not doing it for you. They're doing it because they love the Lord. They're doing it because they love their church. They're doing it because they love their community. And if you don't want to do anything, guess what? Step aside, leave folk alone, but don't cause other people to be acting ugly because you're so jealous and you're that, you're that mad and you're hating on people because they're doing the right thing. Can I get a witness? Can I get an amen? Somebody go on and say it because you know it's true. Anyhow, it happens in all churches. People are all always picking on people that are doing the right thing by God. Learn how to leave folk alone. That's all Jesus was saying. He says, see, he says, your problem is, is that you lack picking on people that are humble because you think that it's, that they're your spiritual doormats. Jesus says, be careful. He picks up in verse seven and watch what he says. He says, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. He says, I feel sorry for the people out there in the world. He says, I feel sorry for all of this craziness that causes people to stumble. People, people don't even show up for worship anymore. Why? Because there's so much stuff out there that's causing people to stumble. He says, but that kind of stuff is going to happen though. That is going to happen. But Jesus says, but woe to the person through whom they come. Jesus says, I understand. I understand that there are pressures out there in the world and it causes people to stumble got that but he says there will be hell to pay for people that cause other people to stumble and i'm trying to help somebody out tonight if you want to do something wrong to other folk do it all by yourself but don't call your clan in to help you out if you want to do your dirt, do your dirt by yourself. Believe the children of God alone. He picks up in verse eight and he says, Jesus says, listen, see, humble people, they get to a point in their lives where they learn that there are some things about them that that's keeping them from living their best life. We all have areas in our lives that we need to shave off. Jesus says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, he says, we're not talking about people now. Other people causing you to stumble. He says, we are talking about some things about you that's causing you to stumble. 
He says, cut it off, throw it away. Because Jesus says it would be better for you to enter life maimed and crippled than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into eternal fire. Now, now, now for those of you that, that, that read the Bible from a literal, you know, reading it literally, Jesus was not saying that I want y'all to go start chopping off your hands, chopping off your feet and covering up your eyes. He says, no, he says, no, he's like, deal with your issues right he says if your eyes causes you to stumble he says gouge it out throw it away it's better for you to enter life with one eye than than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell jesus was not telling people to go out there plucking out their eyes cutting off their hands come on this is what religious folk do this is what causes religion religious people to think that it's okay for them uh uh, uh okay okay oh, okay so so, so you can be so religious, right? There are religions that will that that will actually say it's okay to chop your hands off if you steal. Because Jesus, he's pointing back to the Old Testament. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? But Jesus says, no. He says, he says, work on self. He's, he's not talking about cutting off your hands, cutting off your eyes, brothers cutting off. No, he's not, he's not saying you ain't got to cut nothing off, but he says deal with the eternal that's causing you to stumble. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10 says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, humble people. Some folk despise, some folk despise humble people. It makes them look, it makes them look bad. Okay that you do not despise these little ones. For I tell you that, watch this, this is good news for all of you. Because we all have angels assigned to us in heaven. God has assigned some angels to each and every one of you. Because he says, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always sees the face of my father in heaven. In other words, Jesus says, I got some angels watching over you, watching over you, watching over you. And guess what? They're reporting to God what's happening to you in the earth. And whatever happens to you in the earth, heaven responds. And he says, what do you think? He says, what do you think? Since you're number one, he says, if, if, a, man, if a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them go astray? Does he leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? Now, now, now humble people will be like, you know what? The 99, they're going to have to take care of themselves right now. Because for right now, I got to leave that which I have to, to get back what I have lost. Because he says, because when he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more over the, the nine, more than he rejoices over the 99 that never went astray, right? Now, see, this is the problem within the church, right? We only entertain, and sometimes we only are concerned with folk in the church. But I have news for you. What about your sick and your shut-in? Huh? What about the sick and the shut-in? What about the ones that have left? Because see, sometimes church folk forget about folk that leave, right? Because guess what? You ain't tithing to the church. You're not helping the church out. And sometimes Christian folk don't give a darn about you if you don't have anything to contribute. You get old, you get feeble, you can't do nothing for the church. So we sit you aside. We don't come and visit you. We don't even think about you, right? You leave the church over an argument. Guess what? They won't tithe anyway. Wasn't giving anything anyways. Wasn't doing anything anyways. But Jesus says, no, those are the, these are the people that are primed for the kingdom of God, right? So get out of the habit of always grinning up in folks' face that are always in church. What about the folk that have left? 
what about them? At least the sick, the shut in, and the elders. Okay. Verse 14. So it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So the next time you hear someone saying that joker is going straight to hell, I think you need to correct them. You need to let them know that the same God that is trying to save them, save you, is the same God that can save the person. Because the person that has already put a person in hell, guess what? They're not saved. They may be religious. They may have been baptized. Their name may be on the church's membership roll. But as far as the kingdom is concerned, they have not been saved. Because see, God is concerned. God is concerned, and he does not want anyone to perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. Verse 15. Jesus is on his roll now about being humble. Because Jesus says, and if your brother sins against you, he says, if you really want to be the greatest in the kingdom, he says, watch what you do. Take the low road. Because he's not, he, because Jesus says, if you are so, when, when you get into this place and you are humbled by the Holy Spirit, what others have done to you as Elder Kimberly Fortune preached last Sunday at Evergreen Baptist Church. She preached this thing and she preached it well. She says, it doesn't hurt anymore. And if it doesn't hurt anymore, then that means that you are prepared to go to a person, not because of what you have done to them, but you are prepared to go to the person that has done something to you. Because Jesus says in verse 15, he says, if your brother sins against you, he says, go tell him your fault between you and him alone. We get it twisted because instead of going and talking to the person that did something to you, guess what? You drag the person's name through the mud, right? You put the person down. And you can't go to the person by yourself because you're scared. You got to bring your posse with you, right? And I'm trying to help our churches out because, see, sometimes we forget about church polity and there's an appropriate way to handle to handle business businesses between you and someone that has done something to you. The first thing you have to do is, watch this, you have to handle your business between the person between you and the person that has done you wrong, All right? So how do we resolve conflict? Because see, most folk are not good at conflict resolution. See, some people would rather turn a blind eye or hope that it just goes away all by itself. And this is why some marriages fail, relationships fail, because people after decades, they just keep kicking the can down the road and there is no resolve. And the first thing that happens is Jesus says, you want to get a resolve out of this? He says, confront the confrontation. Folk don't like dealing with confrontation in the church. Well, Reverend Brown, we don't want to make anyone mad. Let's just let bygones be. It ain't a bygone. The bygones are not a bygone until the confrontation has been resolved. Jesus says if you go talk to the brother or the sister between you and him or you and her, there's a chance that they'll listen. But they're not going to listen if you bring your posse and y'all gang up on him or her. Jesus says, find a quiet place. Talk to him. 
And if they listen to you, you have what? Gained your brother. Let's back it up real quick. So let's connect the dots. So Jesus says in verse 13, Jesus talks about losing one over the 99. But Jesus says in order to get the one back, he says, go talk to him. You lost your friend. Go talk to your friend. And if your friend listens to you, you have gained your brother or your sister back. But then Jesus says, listen, if by chance the person just don't want to talk to you, he says, take two or three, take one or two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the person doesn't want to listen, and if you're really concerned about conflict resolution, he says, take two or three witnesses, not just two or three witnesses of your best friends that's going to agree with your lie. Because church protocol is that you begin with talking to the person that hurt you, lied on you, stole from you, cheated on you. But if they don't want to listen, then you bring two or three reputable, reputable people with you. That's going to be unbiased, not just taking your side. Because see, people love going finding people that want to take their side. And you know, I know what I'm talking about. Because when you go to these church business meetings, sometimes, you know, they find folk that, that, that haven't been in church for a long time. And when there's trouble in the land, they start bringing folk back to the church that should not be in the business meetings because they need people in the business meeting to be their witnesses. True anyhow. Jesus, he... Jesus reaches back to Deuteronomy chapter 19, 15, because the Bible says that a single witness, your best friend, is not good enough to be your witness. For any crime, for any wrong in a connection with any offense that has been committed. That's Old Testament. One person is not your witness. Because in order to have evidence taken, they had to have had Two witnesses or three before they could bring a charge to anyone. Old Testament. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 15. So your best friend who wants to be biased with you is not good enough when it comes to dealing with confrontation. Matthew chapter 18 verse 17 Jesus continues because he says some people are just bullheaded. They don't want to listen to you in private. They don't want to listen to respectful people that are trying to help out and resolve conflict. But then Jesus says in verse 17, he says, if he refuses or she refuses to listen to you, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. So you've tried to talk to the person one-on-one. Nothing happens, Jesus says. You've tried intervention with two or three witnesses. Guess what? Nothing happens. Now, your next recourse is for a church member is to bring the church member before the church. Now, this does not mean that you are bringing them before the entire church body. You're bringing them before trustworthy, spirit-filled officers. Not all of the officers, because some of those jokers are not spirit-filled. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression or have messed up or jacked it up, you who are spiritual, say it again, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of meekness. 
King James verse, King James version puts it this way. If anyone is caught in a trespass, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one into the spirit of meekness. Because he says, keep watch because you may fall into the same trap. And then Jesus says in verse 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed on heaven. So if you really want to resolve conflict, oh, it can happen if you really want it. But the reality is how bad do you want to resolve conflict, right? Because if you cannot resolve the conflict, Jesus says, sever the tie. Let them be counted as a Gentile or a tax collector. In other words, Jesus says, don't keep on exhausting your means. You tried talking one-on-one, it didn't work. You tried reputable people who could who could sit between the two and work some things out. That didn't work. Then you took it to the church. Respectable, honest officers in the church. That didn't work. And after you have exhausted all your means, he says, count them as an unsaved person because see, because see, because see, this thing is all about being humble because Jesus remembers Jesus says because they asked the question who is the greatest right and some people are so so stuck on themselves that they can't even admit that they're wrong I had one person Tell me once to say, I don't apologize to nobody. I apologize to people when I, even when I know I haven't done nothing wrong. I apologize to you just to, you know, just to get you out of my face, right? Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, Jesus says, and again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. In other words, heaven responds to our earthly activity but jesus says if two or three are agree on earth now this is what church folk do when they have a program and don't nobody show up what jesus says where two or three are gathered i'll be there no jesus didn't say that because you can have 50 people gathered in church but if they're not touching and agreeing then god said no i'm not in this mess Y'all can't even talk to each other. You all act like you don't even like folk, right? You don't, you don't even want to support somebody in their program. Why? Because you didn't do it. Your name wasn't on it, right? And then when you have your program, you want everybody to support you. And Jesus says, no, you can have 100, you can have 50 people, but if you're not touching and agreeing, he says, I ain't in this. It may look churchy. It may sound churchy, but if there's division, if there's disagreement, God says, guess what? You, 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 you think I'm there, but he says, really, really, I'm not. Verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, he says, there I am among you. We're pushing on. We're, we're, we're getting done. Then Peter is like Jesus. Now, come, now come on, Jesus. Don't you think that people get tired of just always forgiving folk? Because Peter says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? He says, seven times? Because see, seven is, a, seven is a number for completion, right? So Peter is like, strike eight. I ain't got to forgive him no more because seven is completion. Because Peter's like, just in case Jesus, he was like, Jesus, he says, he says, I don't want to keep on being somebody's door, doormat when somebody just continually just keep doing the same thing to me. Because because Peter's like, everybody's got a limit. Everyone has a threshold. 
Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, let us not grow weary in, in, in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. And some people don't reap, some people don't get their blessings, some people don't even receive the harvest, because why? Because they give up. They get tired of doing the right thing. Paul says, don't get tired of doing the right thing. Jesus says, no, Peter, you got it wrong. Because see, you're looking, at you're looking at quantity and I'm looking at spiritual quality. He says, no, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven. Jesus tells Peter, he says, he says, Peter, he says, I want you to up your game in your love language. He says, take your eyes off of this low road and start thinking about, you know what? I can do all things through Christ who will give me the strength. I may not feel like doing it, but I just know that God can give me the power, not by power, nor by might, but by the spirit of the living God. In other words, I may not be able to do it through my human intellect and my human feelings, but I'm going to call on the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me and to cause me to do the right thing. Verse 23 says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. All right. So Jesus, he Jesus, he um, he changes the script because now Peter's talking about forgiving. And Jesus, said, oh, by the way, let me tell you about forgiveness. And he goes into this um, this this parable about a king. Because he says that the kingdom of heaven is compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began reckoning, one owed him 10,000 talents and it was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him, ordered him to be sold. He sold because he's a slave. But not only sold, but to be sold together with his wife and his children and all his possessions in payment to be made. But the thing about it is, is that the slave humbled himself. He, hold, he, he owed all of this money. How much did he owe? 10,000 talents. Hold that thought. 10,000 talents talents he's thrown into jail along with his wife and children but the slave fell on his knees before him saying have patience and i will pay you everything he just he just asked for, for mercy a thousand talents y'all fell on his knees asked for mercy out of pity the lord of that slave released him forgave him his debt. He owes 10,000 talents. Has been redeemed. Doesn't have to pay the debt. See, there are some people in life that expect mercy but will not release it on other people. See, they expect you to do something for them. But when it comes time for you to scratch their back, they ain't nowhere around. Because the text says that same slave that owed 10,000 talents, as he went out, he came upon one fellow slave who owed him a hundred denera. Compared to the 10,000 talents that he owed and was forgiven. And now he has the audacity to mistreat a person that owes him 10, 100 denera. 10,000 talents compared to, uh, to 100 denera would be like me holding a, me being forgiven over a million dollar loan and someone walking past me that owes me 100. And look at what he did. He owed 10,000 talents Forgiven did not have to pay it back. Brother owes him $100. Guess what he does? Seizes him by his throat because he's not humble. And he said, pay what you owe. Then the fellow slave did the same thing that he did. 
Because remember, he owed he owed ten thousand talents. He fell down on his knees and he begged for mercy. He owed ten thousand talents. Brother man only owes a few dollars. But the fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, "Have patience on me." And I will pay you the same exact statement that he said when he owed the 10,000 talents. But he did not have forgiveness in his heart. He was one of the mean jokers. He was one of those entitled persons. Didn't give a darn about anybody but himself. Then he went down and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. But watch out. Here's a news flash. Because he said, folk, they sit back and watch how people treat other people. They may not say anything to you when you're mistreating a person. But they'll say something about it to the person that's in power. This is why you ought to be careful because there are people that are praying for folk that are being mistreated, that are being mishandled. This is why some folk, if they pray to God for the deeds that you, that a person has done to them, remember, I'm, remember, here's the constant thing that Jesus is saying. Whatever you bind in earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, heaven responds when one of God's children is mishandled. Then his Lord summoned him and said, because the other slaves went to the person that's in charge and they went to the master and said, listen here, you know this ain't right. You, you, you just forgave this joker owing you 10,000 talents. Forgave him. Didn't have to pay anything back. And he has the audacity to be mistreating people and watch what happens. The master is upset. Because he called him the wicked slave. He says, I forgave you all that de debt because you pleaded to me. Should I have mercy? Should, I, should you not have mercy on your own fellow slave as I had on you? See, some people, they forget about, that they forget about where they come from. Slick willies. Always trying to, always trying to make a deal and get over on people. And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to the tortured to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. And we close out with this. And he says, Jesus says this. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you who do not forgive your brothers or your sisters, not in talk, because talk is cheap but forgiving people from your heart okay beloved we just went through chapter 17 started at verse 22 and when we went through the entire 18th chapter of the gospel of Matthew, again, thank you so much for tuning in to the Tuesday night Bible talk at Mount Marine um, Baptist Church again on, on Sunday. Our worship service begins at 10 o'clock a.m. in the building. But also, if you can't make it to the church, if you don't have a church, I'm not trying to pull you away from where you are. You can always catch us on Facebook and YouTube live stream every Sunday, 10 a.m., 10 a.m. God bless you. Have a nice day and be encouraged. Thank you for joining us this evening. Please join us again next week as we continue the study of the Gospel of Matthew. Tonight's Bible Talk will be made available on Apple Podcast. For additional information about Mount Marine Baptist Church, please visit our website at mtmarine.org. Have a blessed week and be encouraged.